Okay, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Paulo Patricio. Uh, this presentation was supposed to be done by Teresa Zona here, but she couldn't come, so I'll do this presentation on her behalf. Uh, this presentation is about the harmonization of a land cover special data set using the software for uh, AIL. Um, DGT, DGT stands for uh, Directorate General for the Territory. It's the National Mapping Agency of Portugal and uh, is uh, also the entity responsible for the coordination of the national STI uh, called SNIG and is also the national contact point for uh, the implementation of the INSPIRE Directive in Portugal. Uh, DGT has participated all, over the years in several projects, projects related to the harmonization of uh, of data according to the INSPIRE Directive. Here are some of the examples of the project we participated in. Uh, um, Umbolch is for you, uh, Netter SDI Plus, EF Plus, and most recently, Eagle 6. Uh, DGT is also responsible for the production of some thematic maps, like this one, the land cover map of Portugal, called in Portuguese Carta do Passão do Sol, COSH. Um, and COS is, uh, it's an important, this map is an important map. Uh, it's used uh, for several purposes, like all land cover maps. Uh, this one is uh, used for environmental management and uh, for uh, special planning and other uh, purposes also. Uh, and uh, following the participation of DGT in the, in the project I just mentioned, the Eagle 6, uh, we decided to proceed with the harmonization of this map, of this special data set, according to the specifications of the INSPIRE Directive. Uh, this is an image of the map on top of an photo. As you can see, we have several polygons. For each polygon, we have a land cover classification, a class. And uh, uh, the harmonization process, uh, we defined the harmonization process in several steps. Uh, first one, analysis of the source, data mo uh, source schema and the source uh, data model. Uh, then filling the matching tables, establishing the relationship and the correspondence between the uh, source schema and the target schema. Um, then the transformation or using, the, as I mentioned before, the, the software AIL, uh, the transformation of the special data set. Uh, and then in the end, of course, the validation of the, of the data and, uh, and also the publishing of the using uh, GeoWeb services. Uh, so we divide, I, we divide the presentation in four steps, data analysis, mapping, data transformation, and then in the end validation. Beginning with the data analysis, uh, for the harmonization process, we need to analyze the source schema uh, for this map and the other, if we, we are trying to trans harmonize, uh, harmonize other kind of data, it's the same approach. We need to identify the data format. Uh, we need to take in consideration the special data representation, the attributes, the coordinate reference system, and of course, the metadata is, is generic approach. Uh, for this map, for this land cover map, uh, as I said before, this is a land cover and land use map of Portugal. Uh, it has a, a nomenclature consi co uh, co consistent with the Corwin land cover map. In the Corwin land cover map, we have three levels of classification for the, 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 the polygons. Here in this map, we have five levels of classification, but the, the model is basically the same. Uh, it's a vector map with polygons. Uh, of course, the, the reference system is already in ITRS and uh, with a projection, a specific projection for Portugal. And uh, the minimum mapping unit is one hectare, uh, the minimum distance unit is 20 meters. And uh, as I said before, we have five levels of classification, the nomenclature, with 225 classes. Uh, the second uh, step was in the data analysis is to identify the team, the INSPIRE directive, uh, in, in which we can include this uh, special data set. In this case, it quite, was quite easy because in the next two, we have a specific team for land cover. So uh, after we identify the team, we need to uh, study the, the general conceptual model and also the data specifications, as we should. Uh, 
one important aspect uh, in the data, in the, the study of the, um, the specifications, of course, are the, is the application schema, the U, UML diagram, and the catalog. One important aspect is the code list. Uh, the code list and nomenclature for uh, of land cover classes, in which class is represented by a code and a description. Uh, each, as I said before, each polygon has only, only one class as possible. And uh, uh, we needed to create an identifier for each class and for the, the, the code list. We created that with this uh, URI, several URIs, one for each class. And after that, after the data analysis, we can now establish the correspondence between the source schema and the target schema uh, in filling the matching table. So the matching table established, uh, as I said, the, the relationship, the, 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 the correspondence between all the attributes of the source schema and the target schema. Here are some of the examples we need to take into consideration when filling the matching table. Um, uh, it's quite an important step because the, the core of the transformation is right here when you fill the, the matching table. After we, we have done the, the, the filling, the complete, after we complete the matching table, we then can use the software to do the transformation. Uh, as I said before, we used the software Ale. Uh, for those who don't know Ale, it was a, a software developed by uh, an European project called um, Bolt. And uh, the purpose of this project is to contribute to, it was to contribute to the implementation of the Inspire Directive. Uh, it's an open source tool and uh, supports and uh, the transformation of special data sets uh, according to the Inspire Directive. Uh, some of the advantage of using Ale uh, allows the transformation of to, to a GML file. Uh, it's adapted, as I said, to the Inspire Directive, of course. Uh, it gives a, a feedback in real time when processing the data, the transformation, as an online validation of the application schema, and it's useful also because it allows scripting, which is useful. Those were, this was, uh, these were the steps we used in the beginning, import and the source and data target schemas we defined previously, uh, import the source, uh, the data source, taking into consideration the, this, uh, this uh, the Latin alphabet, because the classes have Portuguese names with special characters, so we need to take this into consideration, because it's, uh, we have a code for the class, we have a code and also a description in, in Portuguese. And uh, we needed also to import the, the code list uh, using an XML or a, a CSV format file. And uh, mapping the units using the matching table we have already done before. And then using L several functions of L. Uh, there are some of the, the functions we use, retype, assign, rename, classifications. And then in the end, we could do the validation with land cover application schema. Uh, in the end, we exported the result to a uh, valid uh, GML format 321 file. Uh, after we did the transformation, we need to do the validation of the data. Uh, in the specifications, uh, I mentioned before, when we, when we identified the land cover team, uh, there's an, uh, in the annex A of the data specifications, uh, there are, def are defined the, the ITS, the abstract text suite. So we need to take this into consideration in the validation. So the validation considered the validation with the application schema, the GML schematron, generic, and also the land cover uh, schematron, the specific the thematic schematron. And also, we need to do uh, we need to do a, valid, a manual validation of the GML, um, like taking uh, anal analyzing also the, the metadata of the GML. So, the, those were the steps. The validation process it's uh, an iterative process, as usually is. Um, we, we did the validation with the application schema. Uh, if we found an error, we corrected the error and then. Uh, return to the beginning, and then the validation with the two schematrons, the GML schematron and the land cover schematron. Whenever we found an error, we correct it and uh, uh, go back to the beginning and do it again until we didn't have errors. Uh, for the validation process, uh, we also use uh, other tools. In, um, 
as I said, DGT participated in the Project Eagle. Uh, it was a, a project uh, related to the harmonization of the Corn Land Cover Map, uh, according to the INSPIRE directive. So uh, in, the, in this project, it was created a land cover schematron file that is used by the, the tool uh, developed in another European project called EMF+. This is, an, uh, for those who don't know it, it's an online uh, tool available for free and allows the validation of the, of the, the files, of the, the files, uh, GML files, uh, according to the data specifications. And uh, right now, there's, uh, there are several uh, Schematron type files available, and one of those is uh, the, the land cover uh, Schematron. Uh, another uh, important aspect of using EMF Plus validator, this tool, is that it has a guide, a methodological guide for the validation process. It's quite uh, useful. Uh, it's an online resource, as I said before, free to use. And uh, the results are presented in a graphical representation, which allows uh, a more um, easy to understand uh, approach to, to understand the, er the errors detected. Uh, we need also another validation using the Oxygen software. Again, uh, we, uh, the validation with the land cover, uh, the application schema, the GML schematron, and the lever schematron. Uh, the idea, uh, this project was to test several approaches for the validation to see which one we should use in the future. So, in the end, in the end, we obtained a valid GML. Um, uh, of this map, of this special data set, the land cover map of Portugal. And uh, the a valid GML, according to the INSPIRE directive, uh, it was the result of this project. But the, the main benefit was not just to obtain a final GML, was also to obtain um, experience, to use this experience uh, with other special data sets, more complex special data sets in the future. So this was useful for this uh, specific land cover map, but in the future, the experience you obtained in this process, in this study, will be useful for uh, other more complex spatial data sets we have in the DGT. Thank you. at the end we all come forward again on stage and people can ask all the questions about all the presentations all together so that people with the microphone don't have to run around all the time after each presentation so I would like to ask Robin to come to the stage Bear with me, we have lost the mouse. So we could get some help to find the mouse again because we can't actually open the slides. Oh, I've got it. <laughs> Strange. Here we go. Okay, two words from me, then I hand over to Brett. So we've been doing some work on this topic you now for two or three years, including some prototyping. The idea is that there's lots of uh, data services in Inspire that are behind various kinds of protection. So we built an access management federation test bed a couple of years ago and tested that with some member states to see how a user could access protected services and what experience that really means and how a machine could access protected services for the purposes of validation, particularly around metadata. But we're still left with a couple of questions. Do we, as Inspire, want to have a European solution to allow a user to come in and start accessing services, a really big federation, and should that be part of just INSPIRE or something bigger as European e-government. That's because this work takes place underneath ARENA and ARENA is part of the ISA program and now part of the ISA squared program. 
where a lot of big uh, components are being built for a lot of other parts of e-government to help people to share and access data from public records, etc. So the kind of key question here is, uh, do we want to be part of this? So the idea of the work that uh, Brex is about to introduce is some of the evidence that poses even more questions that we want to discuss with you as stakeholders in the future. And essentially a report will come out at the end of the year to have that discussion in the MIG. So enough from me from now. Um, the work of Brecht and Leda from PwC is really the core of this presentation. So I give them the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the experiments we've been doing and some of the evidence they've found. So over to Brecht. Thanks, Robin. OK. Don't you hate it when this happens? <laughs> you try to access an inspire resource or, or run a query, and your access is restricted. Why does this happen? Does it, does it happen, happen often? And uh, what is the impact, in particular, on the users of the data of this access restriction? Uh, so together with, uh, with the Joint Research Center, with Robin, uh, as he explained, we did, uh, we did a study uh, that I will present to you today. Um, we will, uh, well, I, I will present our, our research, so our, our objectives, our approach. Um, I will uh, present, uh, the, let's say, the key findings, which are the, the motivations for, for restricting access. And then uh, we will talk as well about the role e-government solutions can play in um, making sure access management uh, does not have uh, too much of an impact on, on uh, the end user of the data. So what did we do? Um, first, uh, the, the, the Joint Research Center had, had developed an application that automatically screened um, uh, about 30,000 Inspire metadata resources. Um, the screening generated a whole list, uh, a big spreadsheet with, with metadata that we then in a second phase analyzed. Uh, we tried to identify patterns, tried to see are there specific uh, types of, of services that uh, are, are more inclined to, to be restricted or are there certain countries in which restriction is higher than other countries. Um, we also did a desk research in which we went through terms and, and conditions of, of uh, Inspire portals, uh, trying to identify underlying motivations for, for access restriction. Um, in, a, in, a, in a third phase, and this is the phase that we just uh, finalized a few weeks ago, uh, we did interviews as well with many uh, Inspire representatives in, in, in different, different member states in order to validate these findings from the desk research, but more importantly, to elaborate on, on these findings. Um, the, 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 so the key questions we try to answer with this study is why is, is access restricted uh, and how, how is access restricted and what is the impact on the users and then more importantly what role can e-government solutions play uh, in order to minimize the impact on, on users. So let's look at what we found out. Uh, first, the, the, our, our statistical analysis showed that um, about 1%, a bit less than 1% of, of Inspire resources are restricted. Uh, we did it using, uh, we, we sent a lot of requests to all of this 30,000 metadata resource, resources and we got, when we got an HTTP 401 uh, for, the, for the technological people in the room, when we got a 401 response, uh, we flagged it as restricted. So that's, that's this 0.94%, uh, this 1% this, this of data that, uh, and services that are restricted. Um, we were quite surprised when we went through this list of restricted resources that a lot of uh, mapping services, WMS, were, uh, were also restricted because we would have expected that at least these services would be uh, available uh, freely and openly for users to evaluate the data. Um, so, so we wanted to really look deeper into these reasons for, for access restriction and I will uh, elaborate on those. So only 1% is restricted. Why do we even care? Uh, well, because um, this, this one percent of restricted data and, and services can, uh, can can teach us a lot. It can teach us about um, the issues of data sharing in Inspire. Inspire is all about uh, making data available openly and freely and, and sharing it across European borders. And uh, by looking into these cases where access is restricted, we can identify some of these issues with data sh sharing and some of these challenges maybe for, for Inspire. Um, and yeah, more importantly, we can try to look into what we can do about it in order to improve this data sharing across European borders. Um, it can also teach us a lot about the evolution. Will these Inspire resources, or in general, will Inspire resources become more restricted or less restricted in the future? By, by looking into these, these, these aspects of, of restriction, uh, we can try to come up with a reasoning and, and, and try to see 
uh, what the evolution will be. I will also discuss it, uh, discuss it in a minute. Um, very importantly, the, the study allows us to, to, uh, to identify opportunities for e-government solutions, as I already uh, said before. Uh, for example, like, uh, like EIDAS, could EIDAS uh, bring a solution to, to, uh, to manage access uh, uh, to inspire resources across the European borders? Um, it, uh, the study also gave us a good view on, on, on the user needs. Do users care about this access restriction? Do they care that they have to register? Or are there benefits in it for them? Um, and more importantly, the, the, well, I think the, the most important uh, aspect of our study is that it can, it can show us how we can improve our services and, and SDIs uh, in general. So our uh, statistical analysis, uh, this is a very interesting finding, showed no patterns. We did a correlation analysis on many, many aspects, and we didn't really find any, any clear patterns between resource types, content types, and access restriction, service category. It wasn't very interesting. Um, we could make a list of, of the most restrictive countries, but also that list doesn't teach us uh, a lot. So we quickly went into, into a deeper study and, 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 and did uh, interviews and, and further analysis. And then it became very interesting because then people were starting to tell us why they restricted access to their data. And we grouped all of these answers that we got in, in four main categories or four main motivations for access restriction. Um, the first one is business models. It's not a surprising uh, finding that many organizations still uh, want to generate income from their, uh, from their data and their services. But it was not the, uh, the only uh, motivation for access restriction. A very important one, and one that we will further discuss, is uh, performance, performance of services, performance of, of, uh, of the resources. Also, legal policy and ownership um, motivations were, uh, um, let's say, very important. Uh, legally, uh, some data is simply not allowed to be open, not allowed to be published. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, privacy data uh, or, or very sensitive data, as described in Article 13 of the, uh, of the INSPIRE reference. Um, also, ownership is a very important aspect. Some data is owned by private organizations who don't want to share their data. Um, and then the last category is uh, know your customer, uh, especially uh, organizations that take their services very seriously and want to really uh, bring added value to their customers. They can really benefit from knowing their customer. And by restricting access, you kind of push your customers to contact you. Even if it's for free, you, you set up a communication with them and you can learn from them. So this is also a very important reason. Now let's look uh, a bit deeper into this, uh, this performance motivation because it's, it's a very interesting one. But before we do, I want to share this uh, interviewee quote uh, with you. Um, uh, one of our interviewees said, uh, providing open data is very different from providing open services, especially if you take performance into account. Um, so the, 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 the needed, uh, let's say, the needed capacity in order to ensure um, uh, a good performance is, 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 is much more of a problem when you're talking about services than about data because publishing data online and making it available for download is not requiring a lot of uh, capacity from your systems, um, but services are. Uh, and by, by, by doing our study, we saw that uh, the needed capacity and, and, uh, and also the investment that you need to, uh, to uh, make available a good uh, service uh, depends a lot about uh, the demand. Um, so the demand in the market, it makes sense. The more people want to use your, uh, your service, the more capacity you need. But also the maturity of the market. And, and there we mean, okay, not only the demand, it, it relates to the maturity of the market, but um, we mainly mean the, the volume, but also the expected service level that users expect from your, from your uh, Inspire service uh, is very important. In, in countries where uh, Inspire is not yet uh, fully adopted and where the market doesn't already uh, use the data very often or the services, uh, performance is not really an issue. Nobody mentioned it even. But in countries where a lot of businesses are relying on these services, where they expect certain service levels, um, the providers of the data and the services really care about, about performance. So the maturity of the market is very important. As I said, the resource type plays, plays a role. Uh, there's much more of a concern for services than for simply for downloading the data. Uh, and the agreed service levels, as I mentioned, uh, expectations from, from the users. So uh, performance is a clear reason for restricting access to, to services. Um, 
And actually what we see is that the restriction uh, to services could increase uh, towards the future. Actually this morning, even in, in, in a session, uh, the, the people from the Netherlands presented that they uh, restricted access to part of their data also as they transformed into a more, uh, uh, let's say, performing service. Um, in general, we also saw that the restriction of data sets themselves uh, following open data policies is, uh, is decreasing. Another interesting uh, interviewee quote, uh, and this is mainly when you, when you look at uh, solutions on the EU level, uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at uh, can we uh, come up with a solution uh, for access management on, on a cross-border level, um, uh, well, actually many people told us that authentication is not the issue, but authorization is. Access restriction is, is not much of a technical challenge. There are several solutions available. We're thinking of EIDs, ECAS for, for EU uh, services. Um, but uh, managing the authorization, linking who can see what cross borders a person from one country trying to access uh, data from another country or um, um, a certain firm or a public administration in one country trying to access data from uh, other countries, um, setting up those links is, is really the challenge, especially on, on a European level. Uh, when we asked people where, whether they were, they were open to implementing a, a cross-border solution, um, well, most people were positive, uh, but they pointed out some, uh, some challenges, um, some, some requirements for these, uh, these, uh, these solutions. They said um, such a service should, not only, uh, should be um, uh, able not to only to identify people. It's very important to identify roles, uh, to identify organizations and systems. Um, they should also be standardized in order to minimize the impact on, on users, and they should be interoperable, uh, obviously, uh, to optimize uh, data exchange. So, you remember our problem? Next time you run into this, I would like you to remember the following aspects to summarize. It's only 1%. It's less than 1% of, of Inspire resources that are restricted, and there are several motivations for it. Uh, business motivations, performance-related issues, which we discussed in a bit more detail, policy, legal, ownership reasons, and uh, the know your customer uh, motivation. It's very different when we talk about data and when we talk about services. Providing open data is very different from providing open services. Authentication is not so much the issue, but authorization is, when you look at it from a cross-border European level. Uh, E-government solutions can play a role, but there are some key challenges related to authenticating roles, uh, standardization, and interoperability. And especially this issue of interoperability is something that uh, towards the future uh, would probably need some more uh, investigation. So I'd like to give the floor back to Robin, who to say a few words on Elise. Sure. So very briefly, as I mentioned at the start, uh, this work took place under ARENA. We're not clear if we still have a problem. Just to mention this 1% is clearly the metadata in the GeoPortal today. The question is how many download services were we able to establish with our baseline? So it's at least 1%. Um, but if this is an interesting topic and we want to take it through as an e-government related solution, then the new Elise action that we launched this year under ISA squared could be the place to do it in partnership with the member states. So really that's me in closing. And just to say, of course, if you're interested in discussing with us further, here's some contact details uh, and a report uh, summarizing all the work uh, with PwC and uh, the work of my colleague Lorena, who did the, let's say, the data harvesting uh, mechanisms at the start of the project. That should be available by the end of the year. And um, we'll make it available also through Join Up. Thanks very much. Brecht, very interesting. It's the first time I see the link between uh, open data, making data available, and the performance issues with making services available and restrictions based on the requirement to make services available. So that's why people like open data a little bit more than providing open services because of the infrastructure mm -hmm. requirements. Good thing. Mm -hmm. Good to follow up. Hope you will follow up. Uh, questions later, so keep them in mind. Probably we'll have questions about uh, the access, uh, the access story that uh, Brecht and Robin just told us about. So we will give the floor now to to Paul, who will shed another view for us on metadata. I think we've been used to be, for Inspire at least, to build our catalogs, 
and serve our catalogs through the discovery services. That's the way we work with metadata. Pretty happy with it. It works for our community, but it seems that a lot of people don't seem to find the data we are providing. So Paul is going to help us with that one. Please, Paul. So, um, welcome again. Um, this, this will actually be the one talk where I talk least about metadata. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm reporting about uh, a test bed that we had on, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, organized by Geer uh, This is the GitHub address for the reports and the, uh, um, the, the code that is made available. Um, we did this research with uh, three uh, uh, companies, uh, GeoCAD, Link Data Factory, and Interactive Instruments. Um, but I'll get into that. So this, this was kind of the main reason for Gea Novum to, to organize the, the testbed. Um, a lot of people experience a big wall between the web and our spatial OGC-ish, Inspire-ish world. Um, I heard it already a couple of times today. Oh, OGC specifications, too difficult to, to uh, uh, and nobody understands it. So, so usual answer would be, could that be made simpler? Um, but it's, uh, the, the Geonovum wanted to set up a test bed to, to, to uh, find out if simpler is actually uh, the, the, the answer to that question. Um, so uh, in the test bed, there were four topics, uh, modern ways of data publication, uh, usable spatial data publication platform, uh, crawlable geospatial data using ecosystem of the web, and spatial data on the web using the current SDI. Tomorrow morning, we have a workshop where we will do some hands-on experience on these teams, on these outcomes, and then we'll discuss uh, also outcomes of the other topics. Today, I'm, also, uh, I'm only going to talk about uh, the topic four. Uh, one slide back. Um, the thing there on the top, I, I'm actually not, don't know who, the, who is the author, but uh, I, I like it. It is Miss Globe and, and Mr. Cube. Um, uh, a happy marriage of W3C and OGC, a current uh, working group, group of, uh, of those two organizations. Uh, Genovum, and, but also uh, Interactive Instruments, is participating in that work group. So all these outcomes of the testbed have been and are already available in uh, the OGC W3C working group. Um, so this is our uh, world that we are familiar with. We have a, a bunch of WFS services and CSW services who uh, make uh, access to that services discoverable. And we have a couple of GIS experts and developers who perfectly know these standards and, and are able to access the data. So, what is the proposed solution that we have on topic four is that we add a proxy layer on top of that. Um, a, a very good advantage of uh, the, the, the Inspire and OGC standardization is that we are standardized. We all understand uh, what these OGC services are about. We as in being humans, but also machines. So, it's actually quite simple. It's actually a miracle we haven't done this 10 years ago, but it's actually quite simple to uh, build software on top of OGC, which uh, uses those standards to talk to the services and expose that to wider, a wider audience, other communities in the standards that they use. So we, we, call, uh, we use a couple of software uh, products. One is GeoNetwork Open Source, the catalog. Um, another is uh, LD Proxy. Uh, on top of WFS, which exposes uh, our geospatial data to web developers, search engine crawlers, and open data portals. So this is the result. If you look on Google for uh, a thing like Lopic or uh, 50, you'll get a search result in a Lopic, a house in Lopic, which is actually an Inspire address from a WFS in uh, the Netherlands. And this, this data is not cached. Um, well, it's cached, of course, in the Google index. But uh, as soon as um, when, when the, the Google index crawls the WFS directly, 
So when it goes, comes back the next day, it will uh, find new addresses. Um, and if you then click on such a search result, you end up on a web page. This is the web page that Google uh, was crawling. So this gives every street lantern in your country its own web page. Imagine the possibilities. You could add widgets here uh, where people could uh, put uh, a comment on a street lantern. Hey, that one is broke. It also has, a, uh, this one has a URL. So this, this is a unique uh, resource locator for this specific house or street lantern. You see in the top right, you see uh, uh, export to JSON-LD, um, uh, GeoJSON and GML. So there's also, we use this with content negotiation. So they also use the same URL, but just uh, another content type. Um, this is the software was, which was built in the scope of the, of the test bed. It's called LD Proxy. This is a Docker image, so you can run it uh, locally to give it a, a try. We will do that in the workshop uh, tomorrow. Um, the same thing you can do for metadata. Um, if you make sure, if, if you uh, facilitate uh, the, the, the crawler uh, to, to uh, crawl your catalog, um, it will be able to, to find data sets that are in the catalog. So this is a, a kind of a sidestep. Um, I identified in the picture that we, we targeted a couple of communities. We find that each of these communities has their own favorite uh, uh, ontology to describe data sets. Um, so for example, uh, for us this would be ISO 1 and 115, but in the uh, government open data community, this is typically DCAD. In the linked data community, people tend to use void. And in the search engine world, this would be schema.org dataset. So you notice there's not one ontology to describe datasets. Um, but such a proxy approach um, allows you to expose that same metadata in a couple of uh, uh, flavors. Well, in, in the test bed, we focused on search engines. So uh, we, we looked at the schema.org dataset uh, ontology, mostly. So we uh, transformed the ISO 115 uh, metadata from Inspire to schema.org metadata. Um, schema.org uh, was an initiative of, of the uh, search engines, but these days also is a W3C working group. What does schema.org give you uh, on top of just search results is that the data is actually structured inside the search engine uh, knowledge base. So besides giving you just search results, it will also it will know that it's a data set and give you specific properties of the data set. Like for example, uh, it knows that it, some things are buildings actually. Uh, this one really helped, is the, the, the Google Structured Data Testing Tool. Uh, it helped us to see that we made the proper annotations in our transformations. It's like the validator for the schema.org uh, dataset um, uh, transformation. Um, this is where the code for the uh, schema.org mapping is. You notice that it's in a, in a schema plugin. So it means it's, it's quite easy to add to any uh, geonetwork uh, implementation. So there's a, a couple, we identified a couple of challenges in this approach. Um, mostly on the search engine side, actually. Uh, we, we found that they are very unpredictable in how fast uh, they, they index uh, resources. If we're talking about the national uh, addresses data set, it's a data set of, of hundreds of thousands of records. And Google indexes two, three a day. So in this way, it, it will take years to, to index and, and re-index all these addresses. Um, persistent end of identifiers for WFS records, I think is a, is a challenge not specifically here, but, but everywhere. Um, not all WFS um, implementations uh, against the spec, though, 
uh, have, um, uh, uh, for example, uh, the, the same layer uh, order of response. Um, but also, if WFS records are all of a sudden gone from the result, uh, we, we, we actually found a lot of bugs and dead links in current metadata catalogs because uh, Google punishes you directly when you have a dead link. It says, I, I tried to crawl this resource, but it's, it's not there. And uh, this came, became very obvious when we had our catalog uh, crawled by Google. Um, Content negotiation, uh, there's a bunch of clients out there who don't use content nego no, uh, negotiation, so that was a challenge. Um, and uh, of course, a big challenge, which was actually one that we tried to resolve uh, and, and, and made some suggestions for, is to, to keep uh, links that exist within the WFS. Because uh, links usually uh, don't use uh, URIs but they use um, uh, internal links, internal to the GML schema, which then need to be transferred to the outside proxy layer where they still should be uh, uh, available. So to wrap up, um, I think 10 years, 20 years ago, we made a very good choice to go for OGC standards with Inspire because we're now all using these OGC Spire, uh, services and it's actually quite simple to create a proxy layer on top of that to expose the data in a simpler way. Um, so, so we focused on search engines, but a similar uh, approach is actually usable, uh, can be uh, made for linked data. You can expose this data also as um, proxied uh, any ontology. Um, well, and the other aspect that we found is that we hear a lot, oh, we don't know how our open data is used. Well, now the, the search engine will tell you because the search engine will, will, show, will tell you, okay, uh, somebody clicked the link to see that address, okay. And so, so it gives you also feedback to, to know which of your open data is used uh, uh, mostly. And then the, 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 un, the, the lower one is, is kind of obvious. It, it doesn't make sense to, to have a coverage pixel exposed as a website. So, so if you choose this approach, uh, use it on sensible data sets where it actually makes sense to have a, a single website for objects, WFS records. So some links to click. Uh, that was it for now. But I hope in the discussion we were able to do some questions. Much, Paul. Uh, I, I just, I j based on what you told me, I, I just realized that we made a good choice with Inspire by choosing interoperable standards for our domain uh, ten years ago and still developing it because, as it seems, you can always build a proxy for any kind of technology afterwards, which is sending your data out to the world. And when you talk about the possible challenges, I think we still have a lot of things to cover before we can enter the digital world. With R, I think quality data. Oh, we we'll have a ah, sorry, thank you. <laughs> so I think uh, it's it's a good option that we, and we should further investigate this one to get, get more people involved and to get our data broader broader use. But it seems that it all also puts a lot of requirements on the way we treat our data for the moment within the Pi community. So persistent identifiers keeps to be everywhere. It always pops up as a major issue for the moment. Uh, so that's uh, good to remember for the discussion later on. So thank you very much. So I would like to invite Guillermo to the stage, who's going to take us in the world of imaging and provide us with a solution for, those, for our big imaging data. Okay. Not okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm going to speak about a topic called an integer-nested grid for Inspire orthomagery and elevation themes. And you will note that integer is written in a different color in 
for a good reason that we will see afterwards. Uh, I work for the IG, uh, National Geographic Institute of Spain and in my department we are in charge of <clears throat> National Aerial Orthophoto Photo Program since many, many years and we also process a lot of satellite image coverage. So uh, all the things I'm going to tell are based on the practical experience of many years of processing images. Inspire Earth Imagery team includes two different types of data with slightly, slightly different needs, aerial orthophotos and satellite ortho images. <clears throat> and the usual workflows for producing, archiving, dissemination, and use of bo both kinds of ortho images are very, very inefficient. In this presentation, we propose the use of uh, a unique nested grid for the production, storage, processing, and dissemination of these ortho images, and also for other raster data, such as biophysical bio parameters, digital elevation models, raster maps, and others. What are the usual workflows in the production and dissemination of these kind of products? First, in the, in the first place, we produce uncompressed, for example, in the case of orthophotos, aerial orthophotos, we produce uncompressed orthophotos by orthorectifying aerial Im images in production units, normally called sheets, that normally are rectangles in geographical projection. Then we mosaic several uncompressed orthophotos in one larger compressed file to ease the use of the, to reduce the number of files. And then we set up WMS, WCS services, and then we produce JPEG tiles for KCHET WMTS services. The, then the problems appear. The first one is the non-alignment of the pixels. If we take the strict rounding rectangles as limit for the ortho images, the adjacent sheets will have non-aligned pixels, as we can see uh, here. Here we can see that the green pixels and the red pixels are not aligned, and this makes it impossible to mosaic multiple orthophotos or even overlay them in, in a viewer unless we resample them. But resampling is very computing demanding and causes image degradation. We can force the alignment of the pixels uh, by uh, making the x, x, y coordinates of the upper left corner of each ortho image exact multiples, multiples of pixel size. But then, <clears throat> if we produce the, pyramid, uh, the pyramids, Im image pyramids, we find that the alignment that we, uh, we are achieved at the original GSD is broken at the next level of the pyramids. And this hampers greatly the multi-resolution and multi-temporal processing of ortho images. The problem two is empty wedges. When we mosaic several uncompressed orthophotos in one larger compressed image file in order to facilitate management, empty wedges appear. These new pixels cause a lot of problems afterwards. Problem th three is fuzzy borders. When we reproject an ortho image to a different UTM zone, for example, the borders of the resulting uh, the borders of the resulting image have intermediate values that cannot be easily eliminated by software. Problems four, five, and uh, so on, for example, the uh, very important one is multiple compressions and decompression. For example, we produce a JPEG 2000 big file, and then we produce JPEG uh, tiles uh, uh, starting from it. So we have at least two, two compressions. And also multiple versions of if, if each of or the image uh, stored and so on. Uh, <clears throat> the efficient visualiz uh, visualization of uh, images uh, requires caged uh, tiled web, web services like WMTS. The same is true for rat rasterized maps and other raster data like, as digital elevation model. People is used to this kind of performance and no longer accept the slowne slowness of WMS, for example. Interoperability of map projection is also an issue because lightweight clients do not reproject nor resample on the fly. So in order to be able to overlap several web layers served by WMTS, they all need to be in the same projection and have the same pixel sizes and positions. Uh, so the efficient production uh, requires thinking from the beginning on the tel services publication right from the beginning. In this way, we would allow we would avoid a lot of problems that we mentioned before. So what are the recommendations for, a, for an opti optimal workflow? Av avoid the use of map projections with different zones, for example, UTM. 
avoid repeated resampling. Ideally, ideally, only one resampling should be performed. Pixel borders should be aligned at all levels of the pyramid. Avoid empty wedges. Avoid repeated, repeated compressions and decompressions. In the case of ortho images or orthophotos, only one compression should be applied. And in the case of remote sensing, no compression should be applied. Uh, is it possible to uh, attain all these, uh, all these recommendations? Uh, that's what we are going to see. Uh, what, what is a tiling scheme? A tiling scheme is necessary to obtain a coherent multi-resolution coverage of an area. An optimal tiling scheme should be a nested grid. And then, what is a nested grid? It is a space allocation schema that assures completely coherent and consistent multi-resolution coverage of the whole working area by organizing image footprints, pixel sizes, and pixel positions at all pyramid levels. And when we speak about uh, working area, today it's, we are speaking about the whole Earth, not, because, not only one country or one region or Europe. So how to create a nest, nested grid? The only practical way to obtain a nested grid is to start with a single tile covering all the working area, that is the whole Earth, and divide it iteratively in two by two. If we start with a tile with a number of rows and columns power of two, the total number of rows and columns is always power of two. And note that one is a power of two, two uh, power to zero is one. So we, we could have the whole earth in one, pic, one single pixel. The map projections that, that allow to generate a nested grid are those rectangular, so rectangular projections. All the work and area, all the world in a single rectangle. Frequently use map projections are not rectangular and should be discarded. For example, UTM or Lambert should be discarded. The two more frequently used map projections are geographic and um, the two more frequently rectangle map projections are geographic and Mercator projection. Geographic covers the whole earth with one rectangle and Mercator projection covers the biggest part of the inhabited areas with one rectangle. Uh, a de facto standard has appeared in the last years in the, in the web mapping uh, world that is called Web Mercator, EPSG 3857, and it is used and supported by a great number of geospatial data and AP providers like Google, Microsoft, Elsevier, and very important open source and open data initiative, open state maps, map box, etc. Uh, cartographic institutions as mine are kept uh, away from this, uh, from this projection because we consider it evil. The reasons for these massive adoptions are multiple. First of all, it is rectangular, then it is almost conformal, no different zones, north is always straight up, and it, is, it has a very efficient computation thanks to the auxiliary sphere that uh, makes easier formulas. Here we can see at the left the geographic projection with this uh, great use in institutions like mine, and, and to the right, the uh, Mercator projection, and we can see that rectangular building, buildings look rhomboidal in the geographic projection, while they look rectangular in the Mercator projection, and roundabouts look ellipsoidal, where they, uh, while they look uh, circular in the Mercator projection. So this is a great advantage for Mercator projection. Even the web of Copernicus program uses Web Mercator instead of Inspire official projection. This is a little bit strange. Web Mercator does another interesting thing. As it is necessary to cut at certain latitudes to avoid infinite coordinates, it cuts at the exact latitude that produces a square. That is plus minus 85 and something. Web Mercator receives many different names, spherical Mercator, Mercator with auxiliary sphere, Google projections, etc. There is also an OGC standard called WMTS Simple Profile that has recently been approved. And the objective is to solve the frequent incompatibilities by fixing uh, one or two projections that we will see and the tiling schema that is a nested grid. Uh, this standard defines two possible map projections, Web Mercator and Geographic, WS84, uh, and two possible tiling schemas, Google Maps Cont Compatible and World CRS84 uh, Quad. Most of the, required, of the requests that WMTS services receive are for Google Maps compatible tile matrix set. So the uh, producers of information and the, uh, uh, the people that set up the services are obliged to support it. So we, we cannot ignore these, these, these demands. 
Application to digital elevation models. Digital elevation models and ortho images are mutually complementary for several reasons. Them are needed to orthoctify images. They are also needed, uh, needed to perform some radiometric corrections, so, such as topographic shadow corrections. Ortho images and then can be combined to generate 3D or 2.5D modeling, etc. For these reasons, it is very important to maximize interoperability between both kinds of data set. To attain this interoperability, it is imperative that they share a common grid and tiling schema and also a common uh, cartographic projection, of course. The requirements for them uh, are we must use the same map projection and the same tiling schemas for our images. The sampling distances must be the same as those in the list of GSD. The height measures must correspond to the centers of the image pixel of the same GSD, and this I don't have the time enough to explain it, so we will, you will have to read it in the document. But there is a big problem with this, uh, this schema. It is the problem of the irrational pixel sizes and irrational corner coordinates. Pixel sizes in this, in this list that you can see here in the Web Mercator projection are irrational number with infinite, uh, infinite uh, um, decimals. The same problem happens with the corner of the coordinates of the, of the tiles. The operations with real number always have rounding errors that may accumulate when you uh, process millions of, of uh, pixels. And also, irrational numbers are a nightmare for human operator, because maybe a machine doesn't care, but a human operator that has to put in many uh, decimal is a nightmare. But there is a solution. The solution is called second mercator. What is a second mercator? It's a mercator projection that instead of the uh, cylinder the tangent to the equator takes a cylinder second in a, deter in a certain latitude that we are called <coughs> automechoic parallels, where the distance are true. And the funny thing is that we can calculate these uh, latitudes so we, uh, the, we calculate this uh, pic background pixel size, we obtain one meter at, uh, at LOD 17. The latitude appears to be, happens to be 33 and, and some degrees. So uh, our advice is to use a second Mercator projection with two standard parallels at this uh, latitude. Uh, for the moment, we, we will call this integer web Mercator. And how to obtain uh, integer map scales? There is a trick that if we choose a reference a reference uh, screen resolution of uh, 10 pixels per millimeter, so 254 pixels per inch, then we obtain also integer uh, screen uh, scale size, scales. There is a pixel-to-pixel -pixel exact correspondence between an image in a web mercator and in second web, uh, integer web mercator. So the images we are building are exactly the same when we work in one of those uh, projections. Uh, this has been uh, tried in the practice, and this allows us to work internally in integer pixel sizes and coordinates and publish the data as a standard web mercator. Here we have an example of the coordinates of one of these tiles. These are the coordinates in web mercator, normal tangent web mercator, and these are the coordinates in, uh, in the second web mercator, integer web mercator. So you can see the difference, it's not. Another problem is that uh, Google tiles, or WMTS simple profile tiles, are 256 by 256 pixels. And these are way too small to be practical as production units. So we propose to use as production units the same footprints of the tiling schema, but with a pixel size of other LOD. For example, if we have LOD 17 pixel size and use LOD 11 tile footprints as production units, they would have uh, 16,000 and some uh, pixels. And this is power of two. For short, we would call these images super tiles. And also, uh, compressed mosaic should be the composition of, for example, eight by eight super tiles. And uh, we can take, in this case, uh, 17 GSD are the number uh, LOD8 uh, footprints. For short, we will call these uh, big tiles. Why we will call the big tiles is going to be explained after. Uh, all of this is, uh, is applicable also to raster maps and, as I mentioned before, to other raster data. 
there is an additional problem uh, in the UMTS services that is the huge number of tiles because they, uh, this kind of services use tiny uh, JPEG files and it is necessary to produce thousands of millions of these, of these, of these tiles. These tiles are very difficult to manage in current computing environment because operating system are not prepared for such a large number of tiles. A solution is to store many of these uh, tiles, tiny tiles, inside a tile TIFF. Tile TIFF is not a new format, it's, it has been there for many, many years, and it is uh, not permitted, not allowed in Inspire. If we generate a tile TIFF with JPEG compres compression, which is not allowed also in uh, Inspire, and use the footprints as the pixel size of WMTS, we obtain WMTS tiles ready to be directly sent without the need to decompress and recompress and recompress before the delivery. I don't know if this has been clear. So our idea is to produce directly this tile TIFF with JPEG uh, compression, and uh, this could be served theoretically by uh, internet directly without uh, compression and decompression or recompression. And this approach has already been implemented by Map Server in the Map Cache uh, software. We are testing it, and it, uh, it looks looks great. So how does nested grid and integral web mercator go in the practice? Well, we have uh, one of the authors has developed a small tool to try all this, and it generates uh, the shapes with the grids, uh, the LODs, the uh, and we, tr we uh, generated different levels of image. For example, this is a, a super tile with Landsat H8 at 64 meters, 32 meters. You can see that it, all the pixels are always aligned. 16 meters, Sentinel-2, 16 meters, Sentinel-2, 8 meters, Spot-5, 8 meters, Spot-5, 4 meters, Spot-5, 2 meters, Orthophoto, 2 meters, Orthophoto, 1 meter, Orthophoto uh, 50 centimeters, orthophoto 25 centimeters, and the same has been uh, made for digital elevation models. So what are the proposals for Inspire data specifications? Web Mercator is not among map projections allowed by Inspire. So in order to assure interoperability with a high number of tile web services, the list of recommended spatial reference systems should include Web Mercator and maybe also integral Web Mercator. Data specifications uh, recommend a common grid, which is a zone, zone geographic uh, grid for automated and elevation, but it does not include a tiling schema. So in order to assure interoperability, we propose th that Google Maps compatible tile matrix set is in the list of recommended common grids for automated and elevation. Tile TIFF and JPEG compressive TIFF are not accepted in Inspire data specification. In order to allow this efficient production and publication workflow, we uh, suggest that they should be accepted. And also big TIFF and pyramidal TIFF sh should also be accepted in order to ease this workflow, that which they are not uh, at present. And we would also recommend the use of super tiles as production units for uncompressed orto images and elevation, and recommend the use of big tiles for compressed orto images. Uh, there is a discussion document that has been uploaded to the cluster uh, or to imagery um, elevations and geographic grids, and there's an ongoing discussion about this. Uh, okay, this is all. Thank you.